So hi everyone, I'm Alex. I am an assistant editor here in editorial production and I'm project lead on uh, colonial Caribbean, colonial government and abolition, which covers the years 1833 to 1849. So as Dr. has said, this is the second module of our colonial Caribbean series, uh, the first of which published in September last year. Uh, there we go. Um, so I thought I'd start off with just a kind of overview of colonial Caribbean as a whole. So this is bringing together British government records from uh, 27 different file classes from the National Archives here in the UK, mostly from the Colonial Office series. Uh, these documents are mostly letters from uh, local governors and government officers, and they really allow users to delve into the administration of British colonial rule in the Caribbean. But they do also, these volumes do also include a wealth of letters, petitions, and other documents from private individuals, which may, may offer a look at the more everyday life and concerns of, the, of people in the Caribbean. And so the documents in the resource will allow users to study slavery from prominence to abolition in the broader context of colonial rule. Um, so as I've said, slavery is a very key topic in colonial Caribbean, uh, but we are trying to offer a really comprehensive look at, at, the Caribbean, at the British Caribbean. So as you can see on the themes on the right here, uh, you can see we're exploring everything from finance and economy, trade and shipping, uh, to religion, uh, crime and punishment, and very excitingly, piracy and privateering. Uh, before I go on, it is worth noting that uh, the documents in the resource are written from the perspective of white colonial uh, kind of elite and may not uh, provide a fair or accurate depiction of those outside or that group or of um, minority voices. And so we're thinking very carefully about how we approach diversity and representation in the resource. So uh, we've had frank discussions in the team taking on board uh, input from our diversity and representation working group and the editorial board to think about the language and terminology we use in the resource. And we're trying to be as transparent as possible with that. So we've included a, a statement on language and terminology in the, in the kind of introduction to the uh, website. Uh, we're also drawing out secondary features that will, we hope will identify hidden narratives and attempt to address biases within the documents. So for those of you who are experienced with module one, we'll know that uh, Dr. Christy Warren from the University of Leicester produced a fantastic video on hidden voices in the archive and how we might identify and learn from them. So we're hoping to really uh, take those lessons and, uh, and discuss them in the projects. Uh, so some of the key features of Colonial Caribbean. So we're offering uh, multiple access points into the documents so that users from different backgrounds or with different amounts of experience can really delve in and ex explore the, the different documents. So uh, for example, a, re a veteran researcher, very experienced with the, uh, the National Archives files will perhaps prefer to use the file class to browse through it, whereas an, an undergraduate might find it easier to browse by colony or by theme. We're also attempting to improve browsing and navigation. So the vast majority of documents in the resource will be sectioned, uh, which will improve navigability and help, help users to go straight to the, the bits that they want. We're also improving searching with our metadata, but very excitingly with HTR and HTR transcription, which will make these documents more searchable than ever before. And I know, for example, some of our editorial boards have been using this to great effects already in module one. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, we've got a vast variety of secondary features. So we've got essays that go into depth on complex and interesting topics, trying to interrogate biases and draw out hidden stories. We've got editor's choice written by our team, where our editors write about topics they find interesting, and again, help us to draw out interesting narratives. And as well, we've got a wealth of contextualizing pieces that will make the resource valuable to a whole broad range of different 
users. So focusing in now on module two, uh, so those of you who know module one will know that it covered nearly 200 years of, uh, of Caribbean history, whereas the second module is really zooming in on just the 16 year period. Look, and in particular, we're looking at, um, at the abolition of slavery, which came into effect in 1834, and the immediate effects. So while abolition came into effect in 1834, it carried on, uh, slavery carried on in uh, de facto until 1838 under the apprenticeship scheme, whereby former enslaved people were forced to continue working without compensation. Um, and this amounted to essentially a continuation of slavery. But this is resisted by the apprentices and by abolition group, whose pressure helps to bring this scheme to an early end in 1838. And after this, after this period ends, we start to see colonies go in divergence uh, paths. So some islands, such as Jamaica, where there were small populations and there was lots of land available, former enslaved people were able to claim land for themselves, establish small holding communities. But on other islands, such as Barbados, where all the land was given over to plantations and there was little opportunity for work, these uh, there, there was little opportunity for other work. So uh, 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 the former enslaved people often remained in these regimented pla plantations. These islands also turned to alternative sources of labor. So we start to see uh, indentured labor coming in from Asia and from Africa. Uh, we do uh, need to acknowledge that while abolition was a very important moment in the period, in many ways it didn't change life in the Caribbean. So the kind of structures and hierarchies of colonialism were still in place, but just redefined. And so the, the government in the Caribbean often takes on new roles and reorganizes itself to enforce those old structures. Um, I thought just to end with, I'll go through a few uh, documents to showcase how we might ex examine them and how, how we might draw out narratives. Uh, so these are just a very brief highlight from a very rich and varied resource. It wouldn't be possible to go through all the different document types or stories in the time we've got. So just to start with, I've got two um, documents where we've been able to identify underrepresented under voices and learn about people from outside of the colonial elite. So on the left here, we've got an address written by, in their words, the, the free colored inhabitants of the island of New Providence. And on the right, we've got a petition from former enslaved people in Jamaica. So from these documents, we're able to learn about the people involved in the Caribbean, and we are able to learn about their lives. Uh, the petition on the right is a particularly vivid depiction of life for uh, former enslaved people. So that just as a quote from it, uh, your petitioners have been so repeatedly defrauded by the planters of their time and have no redress, for they themselves are the dispensers of justice. So they, both these documents are appeal, appealing for rights um, to be ex extended across the whole free population of the Caribbean. And they paint a story of how people in the Cari Caribbean resisted against colonial structures and sought to establish their own rights. Uh, that's just an example of how we can identify uh, underrepresented voices, but uh, there's a whole wealth of documents within uh, colonial Caribbean that can draw out these stories. But we do need to then say the majority of documents in the resource are written by government officials. And um, again, I've got a couple of examples here. The, uh, we are able to identify some interesting and uh, minority voices in these here. So uh, th this middle one, for example, is a governor forwarding documents about someone who's going through hardship. Uh, 
but we need to acknowledge that these are um, are potentially biased documents and may not uh, tell the whole story. And just as the last one, uh, statistics. I'm not very good at maths, but someone who's very who's much better at it will love these. Uh, Sierra Caribbean has a wealth of statistics on a huge range of topics. Uh, so we've got um, uh, election results going from Jamaica, which then further breaks it down by parishes and um, showing the number of enslaved, former enslaved people in each parish. Uh, in the top right, we've got uh, returns, again, from Jamaica, showing the amounts of produce, so sugar, rum, and molasses exported from different estates in Jamaica. And the bottom right is a financial document from uh, the West India Bank. So comparing different statistics from across the resource might allow users to perform quantitative or longitudinal, longitudinal analysis of life in the Caribbean. Um, and again, this is supported by HTR searching, which will allow, which will uh, help users to find these statistics.